Now this is just what the Christian has to do. He has within him the new life. He has a living and underlying principle which the Holy Spirit has put within him. But he feels that every day he has to drag about with him this dead body, this body of death, a thing as loathsome, as hideous, as abominable to his new life as a dead, stinking carcass would be to a living man. Francis Quarles gives a picture at the beginning of one of his emblems of a great skeleton in which a living man is encased. However quaint the fancy, it is not more singular than true. There is the old skeleton man, filthy, corrupt, and abominable. He is a cage for the new principle which God has put in the heart. Consider a moment the striking language of our text, the body of this death. It is death incarnate, death concentrated, death dwelling in the very temple of life. Did you ever think what an awful thing death is? The thought is the most abhorrent to human nature. You say you do not fear death, and very properly. But the reason why you do not fear death is because you look to a glorious immortality. Death in itself is a most frightful thing. Now, inbred sin has about it all the unknown terror, all the destructive force, and all the stupendous gloom of death. A poet would be needed to depict the conflict of life with death, to describe a living soul condemned to walk through the black shades of confusion and to bear incarnate death in its very bowels. But such is the condition of the Christian. As a regenerate man, he is a firing, bright, immortal spirit, but he has to trade the sheds, shades of death. He has to do daily battle with all the tremendous powers of sin, which are as awful, as sublimely terrific, as even the powers of death and hell. Upon reference to the preceding chapter, we find the evil principle styled the old man. There is much meaning in that word, old. But let it suffice us to remark that in age, the new nature is not upon an equal footing with the corrupt nature, there are some here who are 60 years old in their humanity who can scarce number two years in the life of grace. Now pause and meditate upon the warfare in the heart. It is the contest of an infant with a full-grown man, the wrestling of a babe with a giant. Old Adam, like some ancient oak, has thrust his roots into the depths of manhood. Can the divine infant uproot him and cast him from his place? This is the work. This is the labor. From its birth, the new nature begins the struggle, and it cannot cease from it until the victory be perfectly achieved. Nevertheless, it is the moving of a mountain, the drying up of an ocean, the, the threshing of the hills, and who is sufficient for these things? The heaven-born nature needs and will receive the abundant help of its author, or it would yield in the struggle, subdued, beneath the superior strength of its adversary and crushed beneath his enormous weight. Again observe that the old nature of man, which remains in the Christian, is evil, and it cannot ever be anything else but evil, for we are told in this chapter that in me, that is, in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. The old Adam nature cannot be improved, it cannot be made better, it is hopeless to attempt it. You may do what you please with it. You may educate it. You may instruct it. Thus you may give it more instruments for rebellion. But you cannot make the rebel into the friend. You cannot turn the darkness into light. It is an enemy to God. And an enemy to God it ever must be. On the contrary, the new life which God has given us cannot sin. Now that is the meaning of a passage in John where it is said, The child of God sinneth not. He cannot sin because he is born of God. The old nature is evil, only evil, and that continually. The new nature is wholly good. It knows nothing of sin except to hate it. Its contact with sin, with sin brings it pain and misery. And it cries out, Woe is me that I dwell in Meshesh, that I tabernacle in the Kents of Kedar. I have thus given you some little picture of the two natures. Let me again remind you that these two natures are essentially unchangeable. 
You cannot make the new nature, which God has given you, less divine. The old nature you cannot make less impure and earthly. Old Adam is a condemned thing. He may sweep the house, and the evil spirit may seem to go out of it, but he will come back again and bring with him seven other devils more wicked than himself. It is a leper's house, and the leprosy is in every stone from the foundation to the roof. There is no part sound. It is a garment spotted by the flesh. You may wash and wash and wash, but you shall never wash it clean. It is foolish to attempt it. Whilst, on the other hand, the new nature can never be tainted. Spotless, holy, and pure, it dwells in our hearts. It rules and reigns there, expecting the day when it shall cast out its enemy. And without a rival, it shall be monarch in the heart of man forever. I have thus described the two combatants. We shall now come in the next place to their battle. There was never a deadlier feud in all the world between nations than there is between the two principles, right and wrong. But right and wrong are often divided from one another by distance, and therefore they have a less intense hatred. Suppose an instance. Right holds for liberty. Therefore, right hates the evil of slavery. But we do not so intensely hate slavery as we should do if we saw it before our eyes. Then would the blood boil when we saw our black brother smitten by the cowhide whip. Imagine a slaveholder standing right here and smiting his poor slave until the red blood gushed forth in a river. Can you conceive your indignation? Now it is distance which makes you feel this less acutely. The right forgets the wrong because it is far away. But suppose now that right and wrong lived in the same house. Suppose two such desperate enemies, cribbed, cabined, and confined within this narrow house called man. Suppose the two compelled to dwell together. Can you imagine to what a desperate pitch of fury these two would get on with one another? The evil thing says, I will turn thee out, thou intruder. I cannot be peaceful as I would. I cannot riot as I would. I cannot indulge just as I would. Out with thee. I will never be content until I slay thee. Nay, says the newborn nature, I will kill thee and drive thee out. I will not suffer stick or stone of thee to remain. I have sworn war to the knife with thee. I have taken out the sword and cast away the scabbard and will never rest till I can sing complete victory over thee and totally eject thee from this house of mine. They are always at enmity, wherever they are. They were never friends and never can be. The evil must hate the good and the good must hate the evil. And Mark, although we might compare the enmity to the wolf and the lamb, Yet the newborn nature is not the lamb in all respects. It may be in its innocence and meekness, but it is not in its strength. For the newborn nature has all the omnipotence of God about it, whilst the old nature has all the strength of the evil one in it, which is a strength not easily to be exaggerated, but which we very frequently underestimate. These two things are ever desperately at enmity with one another. And even when they are both quiet, they hate each other nonetheless. When my evil nature does not rise, it still hates the newborn nature. And when the newborn nature is inactive, it has nevertheless a thorough abhorrence of all iniquity. The one cannot endure the other. It must endeavor to thrust it forth. Nor do these at any time allow an opportunity to pass from being revenged upon one another. There are times when the old nature is very active. And then, how it will ply all the weapons of its deadly armory against the Christian. You will find yourself at one time suddenly attacked with anger. And when you guard yourself against the hot temptation, on a, all of a sudden you will find pride rising. And you'll begin to say to yourself, Am I not a good man to have kept my temper down? And the moment you thrust down your pride, there will come another temptation, and lust will look out of the window of your eyes, and you desire a thing upon which you ought not to look. And ere you can shut your eyes upon the vanity, sloth in its deadly torpor surrounds you, and you give yourself up to its influence and cease to labor for God. And then, when you bestir yourself once more, you find that in the very attempt to rouse yourself, you've awakened your pride. Evil haunts you, 
go where you may or stand in what posture you choose. On the other hand, the new nature will never lose an opportunity of putting down the old. As for the means of grace, the newborn nature will never rest satisfied unless it enjoys them. As for prayer, it will seek by prayer to wrestle with the enemy. It will employ faith and hope and love. The threatenings, the promises, providence, grace, and everything else to cast out the evil. Well, says one, I don't find it so. Then I am afraid for you. If you do not hate sin so much that you do not do everything to drive it out, I'm afraid you're not a living child of God. 